Hey everyone, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Haas, and this is another episode of a show called This Week in Niche Pursuits News. Now, Jared and I released the very first episode of this particular type of podcast last week, and it was really well received, and so we're going to do it again. So, Jared, welcome back to the show. Thanks. We have an episode two. We didn't know if this was going to go anywhere. That's right. And uh, it went really well. We had lots of great comments uh, on YouTube, a lot of great feedback, a lot of listens. And so it went well. Let's do it again. And we've got a second co-host with us. Jake Kane is with us. Jake, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, hopefully people still like the show after I'm on it. So I feel like I've got a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You've got to perform. Uh, yeah. You know, and people are probably familiar, at least longtime listeners are familiar with you. You hosted actually a few episodes. You've been on the podcast a number of times. So Jake is part of the Niche Pursuits family. So welcome. Great to have you uh, here. So as a reminder, if you listened to last week, we actually cover four different show segments, right? So the first segment that we do is we cover industry news, digital marketing news, and really just a segment now that we're calling This Week in Niche Pursuits News. Uh, and then the second segment of the show uh, that we're going to cover is something that is called Now That's Impressive. This is success stories, maybe niche websites or businesses that we've run across that are just doing something very impressive recently. Uh, the third uh, segment that we're going to cover here is uh, Shiny Objects Shenanigans. And this is where Jake uh, Jake, Jared, and I are going to talk about some of the side hustles that we're working on, things that are just interesting to us. Um, and then finally, we're going to cover one weird niche where each of us bring a sort of weird niche site, something with a unique angle uh, to the show that we're going to talk about that hopefully just sparks some ideas uh, for listeners. So having said all that, let's jump into it. Um, before we cover our very first topic, I just want to remind people that uh, in addition to the podcast, I do have a newsletter that I send out three times a week. The Niche Pursuits newsletter is actually formatted very similar to this podcast in, in that it covers a lot of news, uh, success stories, even some weird niche sites. And so if you want to read similar things that we're covering here in the podcast three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, get an email, uh, join the newsletter. It's uh, nichepursuits.com slash newsletter. Okay. So the very first thing, I'm going to let you kick this off, Jared. Uh, you have a news item that you wanted to share here with Google Bard. Bard is here, which, by the way, can we spend 10 seconds talking about the awful name? Or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, where here did we you come up with this? <laughs> We're talking about Google, which is such a cool name. I feel like Google is a company such a cool name. And like the future of search is here, and we name it Bard. Um, gonna have to going to have to get used to that. Um, okay, so Bard was released this week. A lot of people got an email. That's how it was released. It would be an email to your inbox. Uh, it was released to the U.S. and U.K. only. I do know of a lot of people who were overseas in other countries that VPN in and were able to get access that way. Just, just saying. Um, it's only been released in English. Early word on it is that <laughs> it rarely is citing sources. Um, so that was a big topic of concern, right? Like, hey, where are they getting their information? Are they going to kind of take content from publishers and just surface it in their AI chatbot? Are they going to give sources? There's been back and forth. So there's been, you know, testing that's been going around. And um, there has been some use of sources, although not exactly a lot of it. Um, it, it also seems from reports to struggle with, uh, to struggle in areas where you think it would kind of get it, like with, for example, search intent being so important to Google, um, it seems to really un uh, di have difficulty, like understanding areas that have multiple meanings or complex, you know, ideas. Um, so anyways, yeah, BART is here. Obviously, last week we talked about chat GPT-4 and Google was quick to get BART out the door this week. So I, I, have you guys played around with it at all? Uh, no, I just joined the wait list, um, but I have not had a chance to play around with it. So I'd be curious, yeah, um, Jake, I don't know if you have or Jared, if you have, but uh, I have not seen how it operates exactly. No, same here, man. I hopped on the wait list just to check it out, but uh, haven't haven't seen it firsthand yet. But, yeah, I, I'm curious. I, I don't know. My, my early thoughts on it, 
and I have no idea how it's going to play out, but, uh, you know, when this was first announced and everybody was kind of freaking out is, I wonder if it's going to be, people kind of freaked out when they started doing the rich snippet thing, right? Um, yeah. Where yeah. they sort of give you the answer to a lot of those Q and a simple questions up front and they kind of have the link, but how many people really click through that, you know? So like the zero click searches. Um, so I'm kind of curious if it's going to be not much ado about nothing, but similar to that, right? Like maybe a better experience of that. So like the same people who already weren't going to click through to your site, they asked how many ounces are in a cup or whatever, and they were not going to come read your article about that. Like, are those the people that still aren't going to click anything with Bard? And right. are most of the people that are really looking for like a resource and they want to read up on something, they're still going to be a visitor. Like that's the way I'm hoping it plays out, but I don't know. I guess we'll all find out, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's, um, I don't know if we know too much, maybe correct me if I'm wrong about how exactly this is going to be implemented, right? I think right now you can get on the wait list and maybe try out Bard, you know, it's just sort of lives on its own, right? Kind of like chat GPT is just kind of on its own. Um, but eventually, yes, I mean, you have to imagine that Google's going to implement something right directly in the search results. Google has been interesting about this, right? Because they've said that it's not intended to replace search. It's more for creativity. Um, you know, I, I can't remember the exact language they've used, but they've been very clear, like, well, clear after they botched the launch and their stock price <laughs> dropped a bunch, but clear now that it's not <laughs> intended to replace search and more of a creativity tool. I wonder how that's going to, like you said, Jake, impact the way they roll it out. You know, is it going to replace search features or is it going to kind of be an additive to search features? Yeah. So t- time will tell, you know, we'll, we'll kind of take a look at it. I kind of lean towards what Jake said in terms of uh, I don't think it's going to be like an immediate, like no longer getting clicks to your website, right? It's going to be more like a, a, a rich snippets or, you know, maybe a knowledge panel or something, right, that, that maybe even most people don't even use. I, I have no idea. So, so we'll see. Uh, very interesting developments um, happening from Google, you know, also related to artificial intelligence. Uh, OpenAI just this week released a full study where they looked at the jobs that would be impacted by artificial intelligence and in particular tools like ChatGPT. And so they had a full um, study report that they just released and uh, it gave some of the um, you know occupations that will no longer be around potentially, right? Or at least that will be impacted. And so let me actually share my um, uh, screen here of it's you know in a PDF here, and I've I've scrolled for those viewers here on YouTube they can see this, but uh, we'll talk through some of these. So I don't know if you guys can see this, um, but uh, this is basically it lists the exposure that these occupations have with artificial intelligence, right? So interpreters and translators have an 76.5% exposure, for example. You know, survey researchers, 84.4%. Mathematicians, tax preparers, financial um, analysts, writers and authors, web and digital interface designers all have 100% exposure, which I assume means they could be fully replaced by AI. <laughs> right? Wow, um, yeah. And then there is one interesting one down here, search marketing strategists. Mm. Um, this is with the highest variance, right? So, um, fourteen and a half percent variance. I guess that just means they really don't know, you know, in their models, right? Some might say it's eighty percent. Some might say oh, it's only sixty percent. Anyway, so I think that's kind of a broad term, you know, search marketing strategist. There could be a lot of different aspects that do or don't um, get replaced. Now, here's the jobs that OpenAI, according to their study, says will not get replaced uh, by artificial intelligence, if I can find that. Um, I thought it was on page... 29. 29, yeah. There we go. Thank you. Um, So if you take a look at these, agricultural equipment operators, athletes and sports competitors, cooks, (laughs) short order, cement masons, concrete finishers, fish cutters, dishwashers, (laughs) dredge operators. I think you get the idea. There's a whole list here. These are manual labor type positions, right? Uh, And so if you're in one of these positions, you're safe basically from artificial intelligence. And so the one interesting thought that I have is that if you have a college degree and you're a knowledge worker, 
like your job is in danger, right? <laughs> but if you didn't go to college, like you're safe, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, or if you're doing manual uh, labor jobs. So what do you guys think of this? Like kind of what's your take? Um, yeah, what, do you find anything interesting about some of this from OpenAI? Well, I mean, clearly AI is going to have a big impact on some jobs. And I mean, with what you're able to put into AI, uh, like ChatGPT and get answers back, it's pretty phenomenal. You were talking last week about getting help on homework, you know, so I, I wonder if Tudor's on there as well, right? Like, there's some things that just seem like they're really in danger, you know, but um, at the same time, I, at the, you know, the, the attitude I keep bringing to it is I was around as a professional photographer when the transition from film to digital happened. Mm. And it, it, you know, it wasn't AI, but the digital camera seemed like AI compared to a film camera. Like, remember, there were days when, as a professional photographer, you couldn't see the back of your camera to see whether you took a good picture or not. Mm. <laughs> you know, and so it was almost like having AI, and what it became more about now was other factors in your photography, the experience, the branding, the marketing, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, all these jobs, it's going to be interesting to see how AI incorporates with them. I doubt many will disappear completely, but will just change in the way that people consume them and interact with them. Yeah, same. I... Um... You know, one thing that's just amazing to me as all this stuff is rolling out is like how quickly it's all changing. You know what I mean? Even from like a few weeks ago, like stuff that I'm doing with my business that I'm trying to incorporate some AI, like how I thought about it has changed just from weeks ago <laughs> by new tools that come out and all this stuff. And so it's just, it's so fast moving. It almost feels foolish to make predictions. I was kind of surprised on that list that like translators was like 75%. I feel like that's a pretty one that it could be really good at. And then the one that right. could be interesting is like accountants and stuff like that, which, you know, nobody likes that kind of stuff. It had that at 100%. I think it, it'll it be interesting to see what kind of tools get developed around that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Because um, that's an industry I feel like they could TurboTax and all that stuff exists. But you know what I mean? Like if there were some really cool AI-generated finance tools, right? that seems like that could be pretty exciting. But, I mean, who knows, man? It's just it's happening very quickly. I think I think that's right. It, it, it's changing kind of by the minute here. Um, you know, I think there's companies that are probably already working on tools for every single one of those right. occupations <laughs> that we just mentioned, right? Um, that are building that next tax preparation software where I don't know. You just upload your your documents and like it's done, right? And and they've optimized for every tax loophole you can find, right? <laughs> um, automatically via AI. So um, we, we live in just very interesting times, in particular, you know, as bloggers and, and niche website creators, I'm trying out new things with my site, you know, with ChatGPT+. Um, I know you guys are as well. And um, so I guess just keep listening, you know, as we find out things, uh, we'll, we'll share what's working for us. So, okay, we're going to move on to the next segment of our show here. And it's called Now That's Impressive. This is where we bring something that we've uh, either a success story or something that just we found very interesting here recently uh, in the past week. Now, before we do that, uh, we got to pay some bills. We've got just a quick sponsored spot from Link Whisper. And for listeners that are somehow unaware, I actually am the creator of Link Whisper. Um, it's an internal linking plugin. Uh, that I created out of my own need about three years ago. Now, uh, Jared, Jake, do you guys use Link Whisper? I do. Every hour. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Every hour. That's that's a lot. I mean, not me personally, but someone on the team over here uses it. Yeah, yeah, we we use it a lot. Um, I was, you know, privileged to, to, to help you out with some of the uh, back and forth in the early days. So um, it definitely... I mean, you know, link uh, uh, internal linking, it's difficult, and um, uh, it's it, it, it really makes short work out of the 80-20 of it, right? Like, you know, getting 80%, 90% of the internal linking you need done in minutes rather than, you know, what can sometimes seem like hours. Right. Jake, how do you use Link Whisper? Yeah, um, same. You know, I've been using it since the early days. A lot of times it's just simple stuff that I have my team trained on, so it becomes part of the publishing process. So just try to make sure, like, we don't have any orphan posts, so, like, posts that exist with no link back to them. So, like, right after we do it, we go run that report and, like, find the most relevant spot and add, you know, one to three, like, relevant links, and it just takes an extra couple of minutes rather than going back and 
editing the post. So it's just one of those things that once it's like into your system that way, um, it saves you a ton of time and it's well worth it. So yeah, yep. big fan. Awesome. Thank you guys. So if people listening want to go check out Link Whisper, they can go to linkwhisper.com. And I do have a $15 off uh, discount if you use the discount code podcast. So go to linkwhisper.com, add to your cart, and then at the checkout screen, enter the code podcast. You'll get $15 off Link Whisper if you want to check that out. All right. Uh, Jake, you've got the first item here on the Now That's Impressive segment of the show. Why don't you tell us what you found? Yeah, so I was going to talk about this uh, Koala, again, AI writing tool, um, which I heard about, and I feel like a lot of people have been buzzing about. I heard about it from uh, John Dykstra, the Fat Stacks uh, newsletter, which I'm on. I'm, I'm a big fan of John's. Like, I feel like we have a very similar philosophy for building sites, and he's very much like a content snob, I feel like, is this, the sense that I get. So when he put out a pretty heavy endorsement for like an AI tool, I was like, <laughs> I feel like I should check this out. Um, and they also have a pretty sweet lifetime deal going on right now. So anyway, um, you can do some nice free testing with it, but uh, I've used Jasper and tools like that, just kind of playing around with it. And we use AI strategically, but um, I tell you what, this thing does have some really impressive things about it and its simplicity. Um, so, you know, just putting in a topic and then you're able to, it's able to kind of pull sources from the internet live. So like it will link to like references and things like that. Um, and it also gives you an outline which you can change before it actually runs the article. And anyway, yeah, I've spent maybe an hour with it, you know, just kind of playing around with different, different topics. And um, yeah, like if you're somebody that's in that world using a tool like Jasper, I would give it a look uh, because it's, it's pretty darn impressive, man. So, um, but yeah, I just saw that like 48 hours ago, but it's pretty cool if you're looking for, for a tool in that space. Jake, you, you kind of labeled yourself a bit as a content snob, just borrowing the term, by the way, not assigning that to you, but ha have you figured out how you're going to use it? Have you, you know, kind of taken it for a test drive in terms of how you use it on one of your websites? <sighs> I'm working on that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So, and uh, good enough to, 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 to lean into, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, for, for certain types of content, you know, and I think that that's, um, and the content stop I, I was referring to, I feel like John is kind of like that, like about his writers, and so he said for now he's kind of using it for like social media content, so probably that for now, like lists where you don't, you know what I mean, lists of ideas, lists of inspiration, stuff like that, I feel like it would do an excellent job with that, and if you have a team in place that can come back and add custom images and those sorts of things, like you can... Um, you know, build that into a nice piece of content. So that's probably where I would, I would start with it for sure. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting tool. I like it. Yeah, I'm doing a kind of a live chat here on the screen for for viewers here, and you know, just write a list of the ten best WordPress plugins for SEO. Uh, it's cool. It you know, it pulls up uh, the actual sources, right? It, it gave me a nice list here and, and pulled up um, the the sources for that, which yeah. I, I don't so, know that um, Chat GPT Plus does that. It usually doesn't pull in sources or links. I feel like the GPT four is doing that a little bit. Is it? But if you okay. go to the Koala Writer, uh, Spencer, that's um, obviously we don't have to do, do a full demo. But sure. This is the one that's uh, that's kind of the impressive one. I think like that gotcha. actually creates like a full article, right? So you start with you have to have the paid version to do GPT four, but yep. you start with the target keyword, and then you can like set up some things down below, like presets as far as like tone of voice, and then how long you want the intro to be and stuff like that. And then basically it will give you an outline on the next page to which you can edit, right? So if you wanted to add, kind of do your own research, which I like, you know, add in some more subheadings of things you think you should cover, take some things out, and then it will write the article. So it kind of has that step in place, which I kind of like. It gives you a little bit more control over the output. And then, uh, yeah, the, the final result that I've seen is it's been really good. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting because all of these, of course, are layers on GPT-4, right? right. Yeah. Um, but it's it's cheaper, right? Like, it's $20 a month to get GPT-4 on your own. Uh, this is 9 bucks a month, right? And so it adds adds some layers maybe that make it specific to writing blog posts, et cetera. Now, I, I will just say that I'm not an affiliate for Koala. I have not used it. Um, but I'm going to sign up as an affiliate um, real quick. Uh, so if anybody listening wants to check it out, I'm going to assume I'm going to create this after the show, but you can go to nichepursuits.com slash 
koala. We'll see if I can get you, um, you know, anything special there uh, by the time this is uh, released. So, um, all right, uh, Jared, what do you got for us? Well, you- I I, uh, I believe that next on the list, Spencer, is you. Is actually me. I think that you <laughs> you've got a double whammy here, and now that's impressive. All right, so I uh, saw a story about bear metrics. Now, I don't know how familiar everybody is with bear metrics, but it's basically an analytics tool that you can upload your, you know, if you're, you're selling a software tool or you're a SaaS company, you'll use bear metrics to uh, help you understand your monthly recurring revenue, your churn rate, give you all, create a P&L automatically, right? Like tons of stats is, is what this tool uh, does. And um, somebody posted that uh, the, the the team over at Barometrics changed their pricing. They increased pricing by two and a half times just maybe six months ago. And the reason they did that is because they purchased the company. So the original creator of Barometrics sold the company maybe a year ago. And then the new company that bought it, they increased the price like two and a half times. And uh, what's cool is that Bear Metrics uh, shows uh, the stats live of the company. It's an it's an open company, so you can see the exact revenue. They're demoing their tool, so I'm sharing the screen, and this is showing Bear Metrics. You can see that their monthly recurring revenue is two hundred sixty one thousand six hundred twelve dollars. That's the that's as of today. This is live. This is their real business. Right, we we can see everything, so it's it's very cool way to show off their product. Right, this is Bear Metrics, but it's the stats for Bear Metrics, uh, the business. Um, and what's interesting, so if I go to um, all time, this created a lot of buzz when the company was sold. And then the new company increased oh. prices by two and a half times. You can see this huge spike. <laughs> right, their recurring revenue went from one hundred ninety one thousand a month to three hundred thirty four thousand. Everyone's like. Whoever sold this company was an idiot. They should have just increased <laughs> prices and doubled, you know, almost their yeah. recurring revenue. But now what's happening is you can see over time their recurring revenue is essentially in a nosedive now, coming back down closer to that original 191,000. So the question is, was increasing price by two and a half times a smart move? Or a bad move, and I I don't know that I know the answer, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts uh, on this. I mean, on one case, yeah, they made a lot more money over the past six months, but now they've got a business that's in decline. Um, but maybe they have less customers that are willing to pay higher price. What do you think? Well. Uh, in theory, it's easier to operate a company with less customers for the same, pri- you know, for the same revenue. But it's also a lot harder to grow a company that's in decline versus continue to grow a company that has upward trajectory. For sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, I understand the, the, there is a, a long-held business philosophy that, in, like, instead of incrementally tic tac raise prices here and there like just go for the price point you've now established you need to be at and deal with the churn and the problems and survive that so i would say that if this is part of like a really well thought out thought out long-term strategy they haven't you know they haven't uh you know it's a nosedive but it's not it's not terrible yet as part of a bigger strategy it could work it could definitely work but that 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 that, that nose dive doesn't look good no, it doesn't. And it's just, it's very interesting because the, the original founder of Bear Metrics was always very public on Twitter about sharing his revenue stats and what he was doing in the business. And so it was just this, this huge deal, you know, when the new company raised prices. And, and uh, so in a way, he's being a little bit vindicated. I'm sure he's actually enjoying seeing this decline, the, the original founder. <laughs> it's like, okay, phew, I wasn't like terrible about right. kind of keeping prices where they were. So... We'll, we'll see how that goes. But if anybody wants to check it out, they can go to demo.bearmetrics.com. You can see the live stats um, anytime. You know, there's lots of companies that share their numbers publicly. You know, I often go look at ConvertKit. Uh, they share their numbers publicly. Uh, it's kind of fascinating to see these businesses. 
How's convert kit doing? Uh, it's doing really well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was looking at it, um, I think yesterday, just because I was on bare metrics, it's like 2.8 million recurring revenue a month. Well, Jeez. cause they raised their prices recently, didn't they? Um, I don't know. Like a year, like a year ago, two, uh, Maybe. six months to a year ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing really well. There you go. That's yeah. crazy. It is indeed. All right. I've got, uh, one other one here that's more in the niche site space. So Ian Nuttall is uh, pretty public on uh, Twitter as well. He recently sold a package of two sites through FEI, FE International. And um, he sold them, I believe he said uh, mid six figures. He didn't give the exact price, but he said he sold them for mid six figures. And he was willing to share uh, the websites. So the first one is visualfractions.com. And I'm going to share that uh, here, right? Um, and uh, so it's it's got calculators, you know, conversions, fractions, right? Uh, and if um, I think I need to go, are you guys seeing an Ahrefs uh, screen now? I think I might need to stop sharing. You know, I'm seeing this? visual fractions. Oh, well, now I'm okay. Ahrefs. Yep. Yeah. And then I just pulled up visual fractions on Ahrefs. So you can see it's an impressive site, right? Like he mm-hmm. grew it uh, quite quickly. He has used, I believe, for both of these sites, primarily um, programmatic SEO. Uh, and so he's a programmer. He finds lots of very similar, you know, keyword phrases and builds out, you know, pages in a programmatic way. So the second site that he sold in this package was Worksheet Genius. Um, and apparently he just found a way to crank out a bunch of worksheets, right? <laughs> um, so it's kind of an interesting niche. Um, I'm just pulling some of these up. Okay, so... This would have applied nicely last week for your uh, your tutoring example, Spencer. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it would have. Um, and uh, so I'll show this one here also in uh, Ahrefs, right? So I mean, both of these sites, you know, getting over 600,000 organic visitors a month. And we know Ahrefs tends to short it. I mean, those are some impressive keyword and traffic numbers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, anyway, it's just kind of cool. So people can check those out, you know, Worksheet Genius and uh, VisualFractions.com. Just something I ran across. He sold it for mid six figures. So I don't know. Half a million dollars, six hundred thousand dollars, something like that. Nice little exit, and uh, all through programmatic SEO. So, a very uh, interesting angle there. Are you guys doing anything that's uh, in the programmatic vein at all in your in your stuff? A little bit, and we've had some success with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is very intriguing. Um, it gets. I don't know about you, but every time I I see an example that's using programmatic SEO, my heart kind of flutters a bit. Like it really gets me excited. <laughs> <laughs> I agree actually. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by it. I've actually communicated with Ian a little bit um, via email and just sent him some newbie type questions in that world. Just trying to wrap my head around it because at one level, the concept seems simple, but then like the, how do you actually do that? That part I don't really get, but um Smart guy, man. I love that aspect of the site you just showed, how it's, you're sort of building a worksheet on the fly. Like, you know, like you're checking these boxes. I want it to be about this and a little bit more difficult. Like I have no idea how he pulls that off. But like I think for people that can do that, like it shows the power of like having an interactive tool like that. You know what I mean? Like how diverse it can be if it's something that's like truly helpful. Um, yeah. It's yeah. probably like really easy for him to build. I don't know. but that is, um, I would say, I don't want to, I don't want to label it like more advanced, but certainly like the more basic programmatic sites you might think of are like, what's the population of Geneva, Switzerland, and it, you know, pulls a yeah. data set in, and it, you know, so it's it, the sites that you just had up, Spencer, that, that Ian made. That, there was a lot more going on for those, and you know, so I think that that's another, you know, feather in his cap, like. He's really building out sites that are a little bit more substantive than kind of some of the basic programmatic SEO stuff you might think of. Right. Yeah, I think he's got the skill set. You know, he is a programmer, so he can kind of do it himself and tweak it and customize it. Uh, whereas us, you know, people that, yeah. uh, don't have programming skills, 
you know, we're, we're kind of learning as we go. And, if you and, follow him on Twitter, everything. every every third tweet he shares, I'm like, I don't understand what he just said. I don't really yeah. understand that. <laughs> but there's got to be somebody smart listening right now to this podcast that maybe it's going to spark an idea for him. Like, I could yeah. build that. That would be so easy. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that kind of <laughs> leads us into our shiny object shenanigans. Um, you know, programmatic SEO, maybe a little shiny object that we're, we're looking at right now. Um, but this is a segment where all three of us are going to just share kind of what we're working on, the side that is not our main business, not our main focus, but something that's fun. Uh, so I'm going to give another update on my faceless YouTube channel. I talked about this last week uh, in the episode. And I think when I shared that, I'm going to be looking over to another screen here. Uh, about a week ago, that channel had 394 uh, subscribers on it, um, and uh, this is a fully outsourced channel. Uh, you know, the the face of the creator is not on this channel at all, right? Um, and so we've got voiceovers and some editors, and, and we're putting out videos. So it went from about 394 subscribers a week ago to now 591. Wow! Now, nice. This is yeah. Thank you. This is still like a small channel, of course, but we're trying to get that thousand uh, subscriber mark where we can finally monetize it so we're getting close like at this rate within like two weeks uh we'll be there we can finally monetize it see uh, what the rpms are like on youtube and uh, kind of go from there so this has just been super fun again i i'm working with a partner on it i'm just outsourcing i'm i'm investing i'm paying and you know i, I have a partner doing all the work but uh i love checking in it's 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 just fun. <laughs> That's more than fifty percent subscriber growth in one week. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, insane. The one thing that we're doing that's a little bit different this week is we're creating some shorts, uh, YouTube shorts, because um, my partner felt like, hey, doing a bunch of shorts might get more subscribers because we can yeah. pump out more videos quicker, and that might help us help us get the subscribers faster. That strategy appears to be working. Uh, this week, so cool. That's where we're at. All right, Jared, what you working on? I hope it works. Um, like I said last week, <laughs> on so many levels. Um, still, <laughs> still trying to um, you know carve out a little time each week to build out the uh, the weekend growth newsletter and email list. Um, you know, we do a lot of list building and email marketing for clients at my agency, but. Um, I've never knuckled down and kind of started to just share stuff that I see working, whether it's on my own websites or some of the websites we manage. So, um, you know, every week trying to send out one email, um, trying to do that for 12 weeks or three months. And uh, we talked about that last week a bit. So we sent out another email. Um, you know, it's still just trying to make sure I'm finding the right topics. I think that was as now it's week three, I'm, I'm trying to make sure like I, I go after the topics that people might be interested in, but I'm not really sure exactly what people are interested in because I haven't been doing this very long. Um, but the email that went out on Tuesday, uh, all the emails have gotten over a 50% open rate, so that's a good sign. Excellent, yeah, that's very good. It's a good sign. Um, there's you know some some good interaction. So um, I uh, I think the next thing I want to try, I'm going to say it publicly here, is to try to make a five to 10 minute video about the topic I'm emailing out as well. And so we will see if I can do that, but I'm gonna to try to do that for the next email that goes out next week and make a little video because I know, you know, people, a lot of people like to read your newsletter is super popular, Spencer, obviously, you know, people read it three times a week, but um, you know, some people wanna consume that content via maybe video. So we'll, uh, we'll give that a shot. We'll give that a shot next week. I like it. So is the idea to build a YouTube channel, is is that where the videos are going to live, to kind of be in two places? They'll live on YouTube, yes. Um, hadn't thought about building the channel out, but um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll put that down as a goal. There yeah. you go. Yeah, let's do it. Right here, <laughs> yeah. right now. Commit. As of yeah. 30 seconds ago, it's now a goal. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we do this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, um, no, it's a good point. I mean, yes. I think that's that's an obvious natural next step to that. Awesome. Sounds good. All right, Jake. Yeah. What you working on? I love this topic. Shiny objects are like my life. So like I've <laughs> been uh it's a real problem. Fortunately, you know, I've got about ten or a dozen or so sites that really like make the money and I've like systematized those to a point to where like the writers, the editors, et cetera, like it's all kinda going. Right. And so I can spend a lot of my time just like tinkering with things because I feel like it gives me 
energy, but uh, the tool that I've been playing around this week, it is connected to some of my sites, but it's called Hubble.ai, and I feel like I keep talking about AI, but um, connected with the founder, uh, his name's Derek, really nice guy, uh, but it's an exciting tool because they're building like no code, low code type stuff where you can sort of use the power of AI to build kind of simple tools. And so how I've been using that, um, some real examples is kind of like a, like a trip, let's just say like a hotel comparison type tool, right? So you can upload your own data sets, right? So I was taking like, um, information about particular properties like hotels, putting them into the tool and so it sort of knows that information and then you can kind of, they're building out like a chat type interface, but right now it's more like a form where you can ask questions like, hey, what's most important to you? Like, is it, you're going with just um, just a couple or are you bringing kids? Like, do you wanna have a big pool? That sort of stuff, right? Like you ask those questions and then it can kind of plug that into the data and then give you like, AI can basically provide the best answer. So sort of like a trip planning type tool. Um, the other way that I'm using it is, I've got a site where I just built like a hashtag generator. So like sometimes people, you know, they might want a unique hashtag for like an event or, you know, a family reunion or whatever, right? So for my purposes, I built a form that kind of collects what you need to know. So like, what's the name of your family? When's it happening? Where's it going to be? Are there any other nicknames or inside jokes? Like that kind of stuff is the form that I built. And then on the back end, you kind of giving it instructions, kind of like you would with chat GPT or whatever. Hey, give me some hashtag ideas that include this, this, and this, and make them funny and use alliteration and all these instructions that the user doesn't see, but they're able to, to get that output. Um, so anyway, I've been, yeah, playing around with that and it's kind of in its early days, but they are like making very quick advancements and developments to the tool. But so yeah, if somebody's out there that wants to kind of play around with, you know, you're not a real techie person, it's very easy to use. Um, and might be able to build some some cool tools like that. So I've been playing around with that this week. Yeah. So um, is the idea to kind of um, embed these on your site? Is that kind of how they live? They live on your site, and you're trying to get people either on your email list or further down, um, you know, a funnel to make a purchase. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. So like in my case, like the hashtag generator in particular, um, the niche that I'm in actually has a lot of search volume. Um, and so there are people out there that have that tool. So it's, you know, kind of like having a calculator or any other, you know, interactive tool on your site. So we essentially wrote an article that like has some ideas and like general tips for like building your own hashtag. And then we also have this hashtag generator, you know, that's kind of at the top of the page. So, um, that, that's how I've been using it is to yeah. kind of add some interactive content. Um, yeah. It so it adds, but, yeah, I'm adds hoping engagement. To rank yeah. Rank adds engagement, keeps the time on page longer potentially. Right. Maybe build um, some links, you know, like if mm -hmm. people like it and share it, that sort of thing, right? So, um, and then, yeah, it was, took me like a couple hours to build, you know. I mean, it could take five minutes, but after doing a lot of tweaking and back and forth and getting it just right, you know, so it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Looks really yeah, cool. and, and and Jake is like the perfect person to talk about shiny objects uh, because... I, I love it. We could we could do a whole show about like all the little <laughs> like variations of, of stuff you've done and little projects you've done. Um, yeah. You know, we we hop on a call every once in a while. And we talk about kind of what's our latest project. And Jake's always got something right, some something new. So I love it. This is uh, this is good. Okay, let's move on to our final segment of the show. One weird niche where each of us bring one weird niche site or something unique that we've run across in the past week. Um, something that is maybe not your standard like niche site that targets a keyword that everybody else is trying to target, right? Um, so uh, let's do it. Um, Jared, looks like you're up first. All right, so there's a little bit of a backstory behind this one that I, I wanted to go look into. Um, back, so my mother is a avid tab soda drinker. And <laughs> talk about, you might remember tab soda referenced in the movie Back to the Future when Marty wants to like, get a tab. That's and, right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a popular 80s drink that died off quick unless you're my mom and two other people in the Southern California area. Um, but she was passionate about it. And when uh, in 2020, Coca-Cola, the, the, the brand that owned it, um, sunsetted it. They killed it off. 
And uh, my mom's been devastated ever since. But, <laughs> but um, I got to thinking about it, and I went looking. And sure enough, there is a website that is called um, SaveTabSoda.com. You got it up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Yep. And um, there is a passionate group of fans that are heavily lobbying to bring Tab back. Um, <laughs> if you go to Google Trends, I'll tell you, interest does not seem to be dying off in Tab Soda. Uh, you know, yep, there you go. There yep. was a huge spike right there when Google, uh, when it was announced, they were killing it off. But yep. um, there's a look at that nice recent spike right there. That might be from this podcast. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, we'll double that after this is released. <laughs> exactly. no uh, if if you go to Etsy, this is um, or eBay. Sorry, not Etsy. If you go to eBay, it's not uncommon to see people selling one can of Tab for fifty dollars <laughs> or higher. Jeez. Oh, I love it. Uh, anyways, obviously, uh, all joking aside, there is a passionate group of fans that are doing this. I don't really, uh, I don't really know the monetization strategies around building something with this, but clearly there's community, right? Like there yeah. is a, there's a community here and where there's people that are passionate, you can almost always find ways to monetize. I don't, I'd love to hear what you guys think just off the cuff, maybe crazy, weird monetization angles on this, but there's a loyal group of people there's a passionate fan base, there's a community that can be made, and there's nobody else doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my first thought is just like merch, you know, like people that want to wear the shirts and stickers and all that kind of stuff. Right. Like, you know, show I mean? I'm got proud this cult to be following, it. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. My, another angle might be like beyond just tab, maybe. Um, have a whole website dedicated to discontinued products. Yeah, right? oh, there you go. And, and just write articles or like uh, references, like Tab was in Back to the Future, and you have an article about that. You know, everywhere it was mentioned. I don't know. So you could have all these people that you know had some product they were passionate about in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, yeah, or '90s or whatever that that are gone. Maybe you have a whole website about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if just, I mean, uh, right there alone, search traffic uh, could drive a lot of, uh, you know, ad revenue. You know, it could just be a simple play right there. Yeah, and uh, maybe it's low competition because, like, who's going to write about tab? I mean, it doesn't exist, <laughs> right? So <Right. laughs> That's true. Uh, there you have it. That's a good one. That's cool, I man. Like so it. are you going to buy that on eBay then for, for, like, a Christmas present? Is that the plan? <laughs> Crossed my mind. I think I'm going to shop for a deal. You know, I've got a couple months here where I can try to find a good deal. Maybe I can get a six pack, you know. An or best offer listing yeah, there. Exactly. Find, find a two or liter best. for 20 yeah. bucks, you know, or yeah. something. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Jake, you got a, an interesting one here. Yeah, I saw this on Flippa, and the guy that's selling it, maybe he was on the podcast. I recognize his name. His name is Ron Stefanski. Is that somebody you guys know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know Ron. He's over at One Hour Professor. Okay. Uh, I his... guess he's the seller of it. So this is his oh, site. Okay. I mean, he's got his name and stuff on there, so I'm not like disclosing any kind of secret info. But uh, anyway, yeah, so Prison Insight. And he was kind of sharing the story, um, and I was just going through the listing, and basically according to the stats that it had on there, like the average numbers, I hit, it's like making 3500 bucks a month on average, like just over 100,000 page views on average according to the, the flip of listing. It's making all that through just – display ads but um essentially when you go through the site like i pulled it up in arefs like it's just they basically cover things like the visiting hours like how to send letters how how to make phone calls to an inmate that sort of thing so the audience that it's catering to i guess are people that have family members or loved ones that are like in jail and so there's all these different federal state etc facilities and that's pretty much it so they rank for like you know like if you just type in the whatever whatever correctional unit like they'll be on page one for that and you go and they've kind of got that basic information and that's pretty much it. Like it seems like they have some Q and a type content, but um, yeah, yeah, I thought it was kind of a weird niche and it's interesting to me because a lot of people think about that, right? Like what niche to get into. And I know for me, like a lot of my sites are on hobbies and stuff like that, <laughs> but I just, it's always like re-energizing and fascinating to me when I find these because like to be in the incarceration niche, right? You would never think, at least me, I mean, it's very boring information, right? Nobody's like, yep. excited about it, but it serves a purpose. Like people are looking for it and it's like, you know, I mean, he says in the listing, like he hasn't touched it in a very long time. Like he literally does nothing to it. There are no 
there's basically is no upkeep, you know? And so, um, yeah, it's just fascinating because it kind of, it, to me, like things like this shift your perspective a little bit. Like if yeah. there's somebody that's out there that's trying to think about, you know, <laughs> what niche should I get into and that sort of thing. Like, I don't know, man, well, every once in a while you uncover some of these, right. Where it's just like, ah, oh, I would have never thought time. about that, but this guy's crushing a hundred thousand page views a month, you know, three grand a month, totally on autopilot. Like mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive. I'd take it. A lot of the advice out there, right? When you're starting your a website, first website, maybe like find something you're passionate about all that. Not bad advice, by the way. But, um, you know, like the boring businesses, there's a lot less competition usually, right? Because yeah. it's not really a passion for a lot of people. And so, you, you know, like as, um, as you consider, uh, if you have the wherewithal to kind of kind of get bedded in and really produce what you need to to, to rank a site, like boring niches, um, boring uh, uh, websites can be really attractive because nobody else is necessarily competing for it as much. Yeah. Yeah, and Go I ahead. love some of these keywords. Cool. Yeah. As, you know, <laughs> can you have nails in prison? Can you have Facebook in prison? Uh, why do inmates get paid? Um, just things... I'm on the same page. Never would have thought about, you know, this kind of being a niche and never really thinking about, hey, there's this much search volume. The, yeah. There's actually this many people searching for all these um, correctional facilities and, and all these questions yeah. um, and sur surrounding it. He's done a nice job. I mean, it's 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 a nice looking website, too. You know, like the new buyer is getting a site that maybe it hasn't been updated much, but you know, it's got a nice little logo. It's It's laid out easy to read. It's super simple, right? I don't know what kind of theme that is, but it's just a simple theme. So clearly yeah. it is, is made for people to come read, get what they need and, and have a good experience. Didn't you have a guy on the show, uh, the podcast that did like a DMV type site? Like, yeah. Yeah. DMV.org. Yeah. DMV yeah. And yeah. It's, I mean, it's basically like sharing similar type thing, right? Like a government institution, right? Like the, the boat, the, motor vehicle thing, right? And just kind of put it together in a more user-friendly way. And I don't know, maybe there's something there, right? Because I feel like a lot of government sites, like state by state, and it's going to vary and it's not laid out really well, you know, like if you could take some kind of government thing and like just present it in a better way, like that might be a niche right there, you know, like it seems to work. <laughs> a couple of examples where it's worked clearly, so. Yeah. So a uh, good one. Yeah, that can give people some ideas, um, might spark some different ideas for them to start a niche site. Uh, the last one that I have that I ran across this week, uh, just so niche. Um, so I, I don't know. I never would have thought of this, you know. Um, so the, the website is dog-checks.com. So dogchecks.com with a dash uh, in the middle. I guess I better um, share my screen on this one. Um, this is literally just a site where you can go and order checkbooks that has a picture of your dog on it so or good. of dogs. So good. Wow. Right? And dog checks. Like, that's, that's not what headline. I was expecting. <laughs> when, I first, when I first saw this on the agenda, I thought, is this like a name thing or like a dog name thing? No. And then I pulled it up. I was like, oh, my gosh. So you can get your dog on your checks. <laughs> yeah. And like – I don't know that this is going to be making a lot of money, but it's just a weird niche site I had to share. Um, I mean, that's the whole website. It's all about finding, you know, a, a breed of a dog, or I think you can upload your own picture somewhere. But uh, what's interesting is all of these that you click on, it's these are all just affiliate links, right? Whether you click more info, well, I'll do that. Um, it or whether you click buy now, it goes to carouselchecks.com. They have an affiliate program that I was looking earlier pays like 35%, right? So it's it's just an affiliate site. <laughs> They've got tons of listings of dog checks, right? And um, I, I was looking at the traffic. It's not a lot, right? There's not a ton of people, I think, searching for this particular uh, did term. Did you see the backlink profile? I didn't look at the backlink profile. It's a DR70. Is it really? <laughs> I think so. I just put it into yeah, I put it in HRS. It's a DR seventy. Wow. <laughs> I wonder if one of these like credit card companies makes where you can like upload your own photo to credit cards if they could sort of pivot into this century and start doing custom <laughs> dog credit card affiliate <laughs> offers. So now those are pretty lucrative, right? Dog yeah. dog cards. <laughs> I mean that's what I was gonna say is my first thought is like, well, do people really use checks very much anymore? <laughs> but yeah, if they move to, you know, debit or credit cards, um, maybe that's the way to go. But uh, yeah, wow. and 
I, I, like the whole website is just listings. Like it's, I don't think there's any content from what I'm seeing, really. Um, you know, well, I'm not seeing. Yeah, I, it's just. I take checks. back what I say. It's a DR70, but not because it's got great backlinks. <laughs> so something else. <laughs> Something else going on there, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe it we is won't a DR dive 70, into that. But, but it is a DR70. It is a DR70. But. So, I, like I said, don't know if it's making much money. Probably not. But uh, just an interesting niche, a weird uh, weird niche. So, But it, who wow. knows? I mean, like you said, those affiliate commissions aren't bad. I mean, it doesn't get much traffic, though. But what a weird, what a weird niche. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So uh, hopefully for people listening in, you know, one of those ideas maybe sparks something that they can go out, they can start a site. There, there really are just so many ideas. There's got to be millions of different sort of niche sites that you can create, some of which maybe are 100% reliant on Google, some of which are maybe not reliant at all on Google, right? Maybe it's a viral niche or just has a good PPC angle, right? There, there are so many um, ideas out there that people can explore. Um, if anybody's running across an, another interesting or weird niche site, send it our way. Um, we want to keep doing this every week. Uh, so I think we got it. Got through our whole list here, guys. What do you think? How'd we do? That's it. We covered it all. I guess we'll find out in the comments. <laughs> yeah, how we did, I don't know, but we covered it all. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Hopefully people enjoyed this. Uh, Jake, thanks for coming on. We'll maybe have you on again in the future. And Jared, of course, thanks for being here. Uh, as always, really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. And uh, just final note, as a reminder, anybody that wants to get more uh, content like this, they can join the Niche Pursuits newsletter. They can go over to nichepursuits.com slash newsletter, where I send out similar topics three times a week. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. <laughs>